if you didn't get a chance to finish reading your bio, not to worry because we'll, um, thank you Ruth, uh, because we'll get to that in a little bit. So let's see here. I wanted to start off just um, by acknowledging the song that y'all just heard. So, okay, perfect. I'm gonna drop something in the chat just to give you a little information about the song. So the song is called Sopa de Caracol. And as we were, uh, I'll drop it in one more time. Um, if you all heard this song growing up, uh, if you played it in your household or you heard this song at any of your family functions, if you don't mind putting up an emoji or letting me know in the chat. Yes, Malta. Okay. I thought I was like, when I was thinking about we've been playing music to start off, uh, and I was like, what is that one song that screams Central America to me? And Sopa de Caracol was one of them. And one of the reasons it came up for me was because I was like, yo, I used to dance to that song all the time. And I didn't even know what they were saying, but I was just dancing my little heart away. And so then to prep for this presentation, I was like, let me, let me actually figure out about this song because it's kind of, some parts are in Spanish, but not really. And so it turns out that the reason why I couldn't understand all of the words is because it's actually, most of it is in Garifuna. So um, when uh, uh, Chico Ramos made it, right? And he's uh, Belizean, uh, but then Banda Blanca got a hold of it and they're the ones who made the song, the popular song that it is. But I just thought it was really interesting because Banda Blanca are all mestizos. Not one of them is Garifuno Honduras or Hondureño. Um, and on top of that, they were playing Punta, which is also um, comes, you know, so a lot of things are coming into play for me. And I was like, well, what are the words really saying? And so I, don't know if y'all also grew up on Don Francisco or not, but I'm putting this in the chat. Um, we won't have time to listen to it. Maybe we might at the end of this presentation, but um, Banda Blanca went on Sábado Gigante uh, a long time ago, and they broke down what some of the lyrics were. And it was just really interesting just to hear them talk, the one main guy in Don Francisco, and they were in Don Francisco was like, well, what is Garifuna? And he was like, oh, well, they're the black folks in Honduras. And so to hear them talk around it, but never really acknowledging that none of the folks that were in the band or doing the dance um, were representative of this type of music was really interesting. So I just wanted to share um, that little bit of information. Um, I wasn't able to get on my IG today, like everybody else, right? We've been having social media issues, but I had saved, <laughs> um a post that i wanted to share with y'all and it relates back to latinx heritage month and to the song sopa de caracol uh, because basically I'm, I'm paraphrasing here but it said if your latinx heritage month does not discuss anti-indigeneity and anti-blackness within the latinx community then are you doing enough and it was real. I just was sitting with that. And it made me think of like, even how that song can be really um, parceled out, right? To have those discussions. Um, so I just wanted to offer that up and also give y'all something to dance to uh, before we started. All right. And before we get too far into it, uh, definitely want to acknowledge that as a land grant institution, uh, the UCLA History Project acknowledges the Tongva Gabrielino people as the traditional caretakers of the unceded land originally known as Tavangar and what is currently the Los Angeles Basin to the Southern Channel Islands. I want to also take a moment to acknowledge our team. Danny, who is 
renaming or renumbering everyone right now. Thank you so much to all the new folks that came in too. Um, Amparo, thank you, and Mark, um, who's running our behind the scenes action, so that's why his camera's not on. Also want to acknowledge an unofficial member of our team who is currently making a lot of noise next to me. Uh, and that's Bailey, the bulldog. So if you're hearing random snoring or anything like that, just know there's a bulldog at my feet. All right. So I wanted to start today. I know folks have been coming in and out, so but I wanted to give everybody an opportunity to just kind of look at where we started, right? And so one of the first things we asked y'all to do four weeks ago now, um, was think about what are the key ideas, events, people that you teach during Latinx History Month. So we're not gonna talk about that now, but um, for folks who weren't here, um, and my computer is running a little slow, so apologies for that. Um, I will drop in the link. So y'all could see, actually, someone in the team could drop in the link that's on slide four. Um, so y'all could see what other folks responded. Um, and, yeah, I'm sorry, Cindy, I could do that. Okay, thanks. Just a moment for self-reflection. And then also, as we think of wrapping up this, um, act, uh, this month of workshops, one of the questions that we've been talking through um, is what does it mean to be Latino, Latina, Latinx, Latine, right? And just want you to sit with that. We're definitely gonna get into specifically Central American, but this question was posed on the internet that I'm putting into the agenda right now. And I thought it was a really good um, question that was posed. What are the benefits and complications of categorizing together roughly 62 million people according to the 2020 census? People with complex identities under a single umbrella. Is a blank pan-ethnic term necessary? And that's a lot to kind of throw at you right at the beginning. Um, but as we wrap up, our session today, we're gonna to come back to that question. So I'm leaving it there so y'all can marinate on that, let that cook for a minute. And then as we finish up um, our presentation, uh, we will come back to that question. Yes, definitely. And I'm wondering how the new census actually is going to um, play out with that. Because I know, at least in my community of East LA, there was definitely undercounting that happened just because folks didn't um, fill out their census. Okay, so we'll come back to that question. But again, we want to acknowledge that this week is Teach Central America Week. Um, it's part of the larger Latinx Heritage Month. And it runs from October 4th through the 10th. And all the highlighted um, países, countries, are the countries um, that, are, that make up the region of Central America. And when we think of um, why we should focus on Teach Central America Week in California, I just wanted to put up some statistics that California's um, student population is overwhelmingly Latino, 
and that as you break down that uh, data even further, you see on the right here from um, the Pew Foundation, Pew Research Center, I believe, um, that after Mexicanos, Salvadoreños, and Guatemaltecos make up the second and third largest Latino groups within California. So we have a really strong representation of Central American um, students in our classrooms in this, in this state. And I was one of them. So I definitely want to call out my positionality from jump, right? So I'm, I was born in El Salvador. This is my family. Um, I definitely learned a lot um, growing up from my family in terms of like um, Salvadorian freedom fighters. Uh, Maria Guardado being one of them that we'll see a little bit more of or learn a little bit more of in a minute. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, Cal State, Cal State LA's Latin American Studies program because I did study um, Latin American history there just recently. And I want to acknowledge all the Central American scholars um, that I've read and that have helped shape my understanding of Central America, both in countries of origin and also Central American identity in the diaspora in the United States. All right, so you're probably wondering why y'all were renumbered. So this will be a good opportunity to, um, I will drop that link in the chat right now, but check your number. I'm hoping that y'all will participate. I know uh, you may not wanna turn on your cameras, but maybe um, you'll feel comfortable with unmuting yourself. Um, what we're gonna do is a little intro activity on Central American women activists in Los Angeles. So your number will correspond to one of these women. And if you see them, there you go. Um, Luisa Moreno is number one, Maria Guardado is number two, and so on and so forth. So we wanna give you an opportunity to read over the bio. So we'll give you a couple minutes to do that. And as you're reading the bio, because we will be sharing out, during the share out, I'm gonna ask you to introduce your historical figure and give two to three noteworthy details from that person's life. That can be their occupation, background, anything you found of interest in the bio. And additionally, um, I'm gonna ask you to share what cause or causes they're fighting for and what tactics they're using. Ruth, you're number three. So I'll give everybody a moment to look at their bios and... Your starts on page three, actually, it's Rosana Perez. Um, I'll drop the files into the chat one more time. And I'll give you all a moment to read. Let me know if that doesn't work for you. Thank you, Lana. And this is the inquiry question. Um, I'll put it in the chat while y'all are reading that I'm using um, with these bios.
And when you're ready, you could just, any emoji, just put it up, uh, any reaction on your, on your end, so I know that you're ready to go. Thank you. Perfect. You know, those who have number four, your bio is a little bit longer, so definitely want to take that into account. Okay, great. Okay. So we'll just go in order if that's okay. So we'll start with um, Lisa Moreno. Um, Oh, the YouTube song is just, um, sorry, uh, Lana. It, it was just, um, if you wanted to know a little bit more about the um, the origins of the song and how it's actually Afro-Hondureño um, in that interview, he, they go over that and they go over kind of what some of the lyrics mean. <laughs> Perfect. But actually, if you don't mind starting, Lana, with, um, Lisa Moreno, so letting us know, um, introducing Lisa, Lisa Moreno and um, also what causes she was fighting for. So two to three noteworthy details about her and then what causes she was fighting for. Thank you. Sure. Hi. Um, okay, so she's a, an amazing woman, born, uh, born in Guatemala to a very wealthy family. Um, she um, she started off kind of by lobbying and she used her back of journalism to do so. Um, she lived in uh, Mexico and also in New York. Um, and she kind of organized like a union for seamstresses at the beginning to help them out. Um, uh, particularly, um, I think it was Texas somewhere, yes. Okay, yeah, under a Texas moon. Um, she uh, wrote pamphlets in English and in Spanish uh, because, uh, using her journalism background. Um, and one of the things uh, that she um, did was also, I think was cool that, uh, that she represented the youth, um, particularly those that were um, kind of uh, indicted at the time. And so she really helped to, to push like and to exonerate them and, and to um, free them. Um, she was uh, deported in the 50s and she back, so back to Guatemala and then she actually fled again. Um, and then um, I don't know where she went after that. Cuba? Yes. Really fascinating. I've never heard of her. Fascinating woman. What thank is the you, thank you. Okay, yeah, I got it. I think so. <laughs> All right, yeah. So she was fighting for a bunch of different things for sure. Thank you. Um, Maria Guardado, Marta, would you like to go? Sure. Um, so I got Maria Guardado. She was born, I think two years after the massacre or La Matanza in El Salvador. She um, moved to San Miguel, so Miguelena, um, when she was 15. Um, and she was politically active since the 60s and 70s um, and mostly worked around like farm worker sort of rights. Um, and then during the 80s, um, she was tortured by paramilitary um, uh, squads in, in Salvador. She was left for dead, um, but she survived, made her way to through Mexico, finally got to LA and um, continued to be just like a, a very active person in both the, the sanctuary movement and just all types of movements afterwards until her um, passing in 2015. That's it, I think. Yeah, thank you so much. And I also see that Leo uh, had her bio as well. So if there's anything you want to add, Leo, or if you could just recap what are um, some causes that she was fighting for. 
Um, I think for me, the part that sticks out is uh, knowing time and place as far as like where she was born and what was going on. As a person who's a history teacher, like I, I try to take note of like that historiography um, of her being born two years after La Matanza and obviously like how that sort of, um, how that sort of event would go and shape somebody else's life. So the fact that she ended up growing up to, to fight for uh, the rights of people that even though it said that she was poor, that were even poorer than she was. Um, and then also the fact that like when she got to LA, people wanted to um, make her be known as a refugee or a torture survivor. And she decided to kind of flip that and turn it into something that was much more positive. Um, and she tried, she decided to transcend those labels and decided to, to fight for causes for the poor immigrants, uh, the people of Los Angeles to use poetry, Palestinian liberation, public transportation, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Rachel, you have, or actually let's start with Ruth, if you don't mind, uh, with Rosana Perez. Hello, everyone. So the beautiful Rosana Perez is from El Salvador, and she kind of led um, by, well, she, at the early adolescence age, um, became like an activist with um, her, modeled by her teachers. Eventually she was privileged enough to um, get an education and studied philosophy and became a leader in the Movimiento de Liberación Popular, the popular movement um, in El Salvador. Um, she was categorized as a communist and so was her husband. So sadly, the government went after her husband and he you know, was kidnapped, never returned. Um, and she was also imprisoned for 10 years. Um, and um, in 1983, um, she, she was granted amnesty as a token of goodwill by Napoleon Duarte, who was the elected president of El Salvador. And eventually she made it to the uh, golden state of California. And she started um, working in factories, but continued her activism, um, not forgetting you know, the struggles of her homeland and what she went through. And she uh, joined a CSUN's Central American Studies program and eventually created a stories, a collection of stories called Flight to Freedom, the story of Central American refugees in California. Thank you so much. Yeah, she's amazing and has done so much good work. And uh, Rachel, if you don't mind recapping, what are some of the things that she was fighting for or anything that stood out to you? Well, I, I don't remember if Ruth said this, but one thing that stood out to me was that she was politically active since she was in middle school. So just like the lifetime of activism. Um, and they said she was sort of advantaged, but because she was in the university and being persecuted, she saw her interests tied to sort of the broader um, mass of people. Um, and then, yeah, continued her activism throughout her life, um, supporting refugees when, once she came to the US um, as well. Thank you. Yeah, that transnational uh, piece that seems to show up in a lot of, yeah, it's not just leaving your country of origin, but also being part of the struggles in, in diaspora. Perfect, thank you. Daisy, number four. Um, Jennifer Carsamo, um, whose grandma and uncle and mom came from El Salvador, and she was the first to LA and was the first um, person in her family born with a US birth certificate and went to high school and graduated with honors and um, is um, then went to UCLA and got involved in a youth group that I think a family member had started and um, felt like she really belonged there. And a lot of her work, um, according to this bio, focuses on um, identity and understanding the diaspora from El Salvador um, and um, the refugee experience and um, is now a PhD student 
Um, so sort of some tactics that she's using are, is both um, critical research in her own community. And also she's a documentary filmmaker um, and has done one document, made one film and is working on a second, but the first one focused on um, taking this youth delegation to El Salvador. So um, she is getting a lot done. Yes, thank you so much. And Ams, I know you had her as well. If there's anything you wanna add or anything you found interesting? I'm coming, sorry. Um, one of the things that I found interesting was that um, she is the first so far who's been born in the United States and how there was still this very strong connection um, to uh, her family's homeland and the work that she's doing is um, <clears throat> very much connected to activism. So there's this continuum of activism and she's working with organizations that support um, immigrants and refugees. So that was, uh, that, that stood out for me. Thank you, thank you so much. And Jay Dell, I'm gonna assume that that's Jason. Yes, all right. Uh, and Jason, you have Wendy Carrillo, so if you don't mind starting off. Oh wow, I didn't, I didn't understand, I didn't realize I had a number. I read all of them. <laughs> uh, what did you find interesting about Wendy? Like, if you could say one thing. I also thought it was interesting. She was. Um, Oh, no, she, she wasn't born in the U.S., sorry, was she? No, she came, Looks I think. like she migrated at a young age. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, actually, what I found interesting was her... Um, oh, no, is that just on my end, or...? No, I think it's bad Wi-Fi on his end. Jason, I think we're having trouble hearing you. Okay, and while he gets that fixed, um, Danny, do you wanna share something about Wendy Carrillo? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Uh, so like the, the two to three noteworthy details from her life, like I would say the first one is some like kind of a shared experience of um, like um, youth that came over in the 1980s from El Salvador. She, she was uh, um, brought over by her mother who felt that it was unsafe to remain in the country due to the civil war. Um, and uh, she's, she has, I think, four siblings. And I, I think that um, she is the oldest of the four. Um, another thing that I found really interesting is that she was about to drop out of high school, and I'm guessing her principal, who might have been Principal Ronquillo at the time at Roosevelt High School, um, uh, talked her out of it and uh, convinced her to remain, and um, she actually um, graduated. She went to community college, so shout out to community college folks, um, went to Cal State LA, and then um, went to uh, USC. Um, I'd say another really interesting thing, and most people in LA kind of became familiar with Wendy um, because she was on this, uh, power, the Power 106, I don't think it's around anymore. Uh, power 106, that was like the, the kind of hip hop radio station that we had back in the day. And uh, she hosted a program called Knowledge is Power and sort of made her name and became known in the community for that program. And from there was able to, um, take her conversations and some of her ideas to different um, publications like HuffPost and the Young Turks and Al Jazeera America. Um, and she also did some communication work. And the final fun, um, interesting, I was gonna say fun fact, but interesting noteworthy detail is that um, she tried to run for Congress and she did run for Congress in 2017, it was unsuccessful, but now in 2019, um, she's the only Salvadorian state lawmaker um, and only legislator to travel with Governor 
uh, Gavin Newsom um, on his first international trip um, to El Salvador. So that's that's pretty that's pretty cool. Um, so she is Wendy is uh, fighting for um, like a lot of uh, there's a lot of things, but it's it's mostly like organizing efforts around fair wage uh, for um, caregivers and folks that take care of seniors and people with disabilities, um, immigration reform, um, and a lot of things that impact the Salvadoran during your community here in LA and in other um, communities as well. Thank you so much for that. And Jason, I did want to give you an opportunity to share that point that you found interesting. Well, I'm working right now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I shared that link. I looked it up, uh, see if there was a decent, and I, I like the link I shared because it has video of what the lyrics are about. But um, so there's that, the, the link I shared is a song named El Poema de Amor. El Poema de Amor was written by Roque Dalton, poeta salvadoreño. And Roque Dalton wrote that as kind of like a tragic love letter to Los Salvadoreños. Um, and uh, uh, part of the lyrics of that Oh no. Gives me a touch of inspiration. Sorry, Jason. I feel like there's some technical issues that are going on. Fair warning, the chorus has a curse word. Oh. <laughs> no. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, sorry. Uh, we're gonna work on the Wi-Fi piece because uh, Jason will be our guest speaker uh, in a little bit. Um, so thank you all so much. And like I um, put previously, the inquiry question that I have to like um, look at all of these um, bios with, is I dropped it in the chat. Sorry, I seem to be having internet issues as well right now. In what ways have these Central American women activists helped shape their community in Los Angeles and beyond, right? And that's the question that kind of guides this inquiry. Yes, oh, internet today. Um, and as you're seeing, right, I had to put Los Angeles and beyond because for the first three, um, they were born in different parts of Central America and then came and did work here. Um, but I also want to acknowledge that um, this is not an exhaustive list by any means. Um, and that this is a really, really specific list for folks and women because uh, the activity that I created this for. Okay, now there's lightning and thunder. That's awesome. <laughs> um, the activity that I created this for was um, women focused um, and Los Angeles focused. So that's why there's those parameters that I'm working with. But I do want to um, also state that Marta brought up Prudencia Ayala. So there's so many folks, um, so many more folks. Uh, Jason just brought up Roque Dalton um, that could have been included if the inquiry question was wider, right? Um, so we will get to some of those names, uh, but I definitely wanted to use this as a space to highlight these women in particular, um, because if you all have been with us for the last uh, three a month, three weeks a month, um, this is one of the, the shifts that we had been focusing on during our reimagining sessions. So how might we highlight um, Latino communities in the US? So that's why that the bios that I were given were specifically about um, folks doing work in the US and in particular in Los Angeles. So just wanted to highlight that. 
And because also the second point that we've been looking at is how do we uplift local stories and contributions so that our students see themselves. And I think, um, right, uh, the piece that Daniel brought up about how um, Wendy Carrillo almost dropped out of school, I think that's a really um, important thing to know because it's, it's, I know there's been plenty of times where I wanted to almost have dropped out of school at different points across the educational pipeline. Like I dropped out of grad school for two weeks. Uh, that was my most recent stint of dropping out of school. I went back <laughs> and finished, but um, that's definitely part of like, you know, uh, a lot of people's journey. Um, and yes, thank you, Rachel. I love the local focus and personalization. Yes, awesome. Um, I do wanna shout out um, some of the places where I got my information. Um, and also some ways to expand it. So um, Rosana Perez, on top of all the work that y'all heard her do is also an author. Um, and she wrote um, Flight to Freedom. And I got some of my information in there, but I, for folks that are coming from the Bay Area, there's also a big chunk of this book that focuses on um, Central American um, freedom fighters doing work up in the Bay Area, specifically San Francisco. Um, so this might, this will be a good book. There's also men in there too. I just obviously didn't use them for my activity, but wanted to highlight that. And then also Central Americans in Los Angeles, um, which is mostly photographs. So I think this is like a good way to just kind of see um, Central Americans um, throughout the centuries, which I also think is a really important thing to focus on, right? That we, yes, the mass migration of Central Americans happens in the late seventies, early eighties, but we've been const a constant part of US history um, for centuries. So I wanna acknowledge that. Okay. And part of our work today, which um, we, I'm going to get through some of this and then we do have our special guest. Um, and this also though coincides with his presentation. So. We want to talk about culturally responsive. That was um, what we were focusing on. How do we be culturally responsive um, when teaching about Central American Week? Right? So just for some quick universal understandings, I'm going to put up the definition I'm using for culturally responsive pedagogy. And the two um, scholars that I'm using to put my definition together are Tyrone Howard from UCLA and Patrick uh, Kamanjian from the University of San Francisco. So to go back to Rachel's point, right? If we're being culturally responsive, we wanna highlight um, attributes, characteristics, knowledge, backgrounds of our students in our classrooms. Um, we also wanna center a caring disposition and that's gonna be important as we talk through this next piece in caring for our students' culture. And uh, that added piece of authentic caring is best communicated by the ways we apply our pedagogy. And I wanna call that out in particular because I want to very quickly, um, just want to acknowledge that the framework also talks about being culturally responsive educators in the history classroom. So um, this is part of the work the framework is asking us to do as well. Um, we won't stay on here for too long. But definitely about filling in the gaps, right? And so that interactivity that we just did was a way to fill in some of those gaps. Um, for Central American students not seeing themselves represented. Oh, okay. I'm realizing that this is a bit, but um, I wanna call out and just in the, looking at being culturally responsive and how can we implement that with resources that are already available. So I wanna highlight this particular um, lesson from Teaching Central America, which I've heard a lot of folks use. It's a great um, website um, and they have an introductory lesson um, called Central America, an introductory lesson. 
you want to click on it, um, <laughs> I just realized I'm being repetitive. Um, if you want to click on it, it's free. You do have to give them your email. So if you haven't seen this lesson before, this might be an opportunity to just open it up. Um, give them your, you know, burner account. So that way you don't need to worry about that or not. You choose to give them your information. Um, I want to say that overall, this website is a good website in terms of calling attention to teaching Central America and um, giving opportunity for resources that aren't really available. But I also want to highlight that um, the importance of intentionality and um, per having purpose behind creating lessons. And so with that, I am, I see Rachel's comment in the chat. Don't at me, Rachel. That's all I gotta say. Um, wanna take a deeper dive into this particular lesson. So in case you wanna use it, it's very much similar to the activity we just did where it's like a, you get a character, you share about them, you learn about other people by sharing, right? But this particular lesson, um, highlights, this is their lesson objective. Ooh, I'm realizing I'm not gonna have time for all this. Um, but the idea for behind the lesson is if you learn about different historical figures from different countries in Central America, then you're gonna get a more nuanced view of US foreign policy. Um, and you could tie that back to then um, more recent Central American history. And I really loved the lesson objective. I think it's necessary. The questions that came up for our group as we were looking at this particular lesson was, what do you expose your students to before this lesson? So I do want to call out that this lesson is centered within um, the Cold War era. How might we do this lesson in a more culturally responsive way is something that we were sitting at with after looking at this lesson. And then, um, what do we do after this lesson with our students? And so those are the three questions that we had after um, exploring this lesson. And I'm just gonna sit with, before we transition, just number two, we'll come back to the rest of this, but number two, how might we do this lesson in a more culturally responsive way? And I'm calling this out, um, calling this in, uh, because these are some of the countries and the historical figures that are being um, that there are character bios for in this lesson, right? So the one that we just did was Central Americans in the US. This one is about Central Americans in countries of origin. And you can see they have El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, and Nicaragua, and the United States. How many of y'all have this lesson open? If you want to have a more clear idea of what I'm talking about, you can download the lesson right now so that you, I'll point you to certain spots. Um, but if you don't, you'll have this recording and you can go back to this recording um, after you download the lesson. So things that I want to bring up in terms of how can we do this lesson in a more culturally responsive way is I want to highlight that there are individuals dictators, um, military generals within intermixed, interwoven with freedom fighters. And I want to call that out specifically because I personally have a problem with this. Um, I think if those of you that have the lessons open, if you can take a look at one of those bios, you can see how they're written. And I understand that they're written in a way for like the students to play these characters, but these are folks that committed really big atrocities. And just in the point of being culturally responsive, I feel like there should be mucho mas cariño, mucho mas care put into how this history is being delivered than in that way. So I'm not saying don't talk about Efrain Rios Mont, but I'm, I am saying he might not be the best person to be a historical figure character that you would want your students to take on as a personality and then be in conversation with Rigoberta Menchu. 
that doesn't feel right to me. That doesn't feel culturally responsive. So I wanted to call that out in particular. Also with that, I wanna call out that if I were doing this lesson, I would take out the US period because I just don't want the US gaze into this from jump on a personal note, right? I'm not saying don't bring in, the US is a very important factor in the region, but when we're doing this activity, I would personally get back to that and not include the US in this activity. Yes, yes. Um, I also wanna call out, so these in orange, I wanna call out that these are problematic figures in the span of uh, the history of that country. So like Daniel Ortega for sure is seen as a revolutionary um, leftist at the beginning of the revolution in Nicaragua, but he's a problematic figure when you bring him up to today. And so uh, if you're gonna include some of the folks um, that are in orange, you really need to do more research and I would encourage you to bring them up to today because they become problematic figures. Um, for instance, um, Violeta Chamorro, um, the way her character's written, you wouldn't understand that she was a US-backed uh, president in the region. And that has implications that are nuanced and that can't really be presented well in a walk and talk or in a tea party activity like the one that we just did right now. So wanna call that out. And then the importance of having a purpose to your question, right? Like an inquiry question that guides this type of activity, like the inquiry question that I had posed for you because when I was thinking of, okay, if I got rid of all of the folks that are just here, um, then I'm looking at freedom fighters in Central America. So now I have an angle to which to do this activity with. And so once I looked at it through that lens, then there are folks in here that they are bringing, they are bringing to life the realities of everyday living, but I would need to add to their um, character bios to tease out for students how they are freedom fighters because we would recognize that they are, but students might need a little help in recognizing that. So it's once you have your inquiry question, you can go back into these bios and like make sure that students can answer that inquiry question with the bios that you're giving. Does that make sense? So even as I wrote the character bios for all the women, um, I had that inquiry question in mind to make sure that, that you all could answer those questions as we were going along. Um, and, I, and then I just wanna call out that because I said get rid of the United States I'm not saying don't teach Roberto Clemente. I love him, personal hero, but doesn't quite fit in, especially if we're saying we're gonna look at freedom, fighter, freedom fighters in Central America, because he's from Puerto Rico. So you could also, again, you, wanna, you could bring in that history later, but wanna acknowledge that, um, that he might not fit with the inquiry question and with the new angle. So I just really wanted to call this out, especially as we're transitioning out of this, because on a personal note, right, I understand in my, his, my personal history, like Dabulzan was responsible for the killing of Archbishop Romero. I would, I could never have my students take on that role. And General Maximiliano Hernandez, he was the one who was in power during La Matanza, he was the one who called for those orders that you all read about. And so those are really hard histories that would need so much, I, I just wouldn't do it, that's all. I, I, can't, I can't even express, like it's just really hard. Uh, but I see y'all in the chat, I see y'all, um, understanding where I'm going with this. So just wanted to be really upfront because I know a lot of folks use this resource. Um, I think if you did those modifications, took some of the bios out, it's still, it could still work as a resource, but it's one of those things that 
unless you knew the history, um, it you wouldn't know, like, you know what I mean? And I think sometimes like teachers see like resources like, oh, and like tend to plug and play. And this is like us really being culturally responsive with the resources we choose to use in our classroom. Yeah, yeah, I see that, yeah. It's like you're acting as them. Um, and then I also sent something in the comments and we will transition. Um, we'll get back to these slides because I do have ideas for how to modify that lesson in particular. But folks are asking of like, where would I know, how would I begin to learn this stuff if I don't know this stuff? And so I just wanna end with this slide. Um, these are two books that I would turn to as an educator um, to learn about um, US intervention in Latin America, but also within there, there are chapters for Central America. So as you're thinking like, well, I don't know who all those folks are on my screen that I just looked at and I need to learn more. These are two books that I could point you to. Um, Harvest of Empire is also a documentary, so you could find pieces of that in um, on YouTube. But again, it wouldn't be a documentary that I would just plug and play into my classroom because again, there's a lot of hard histories that are being discussed. Um, and so these would be places for you that I would encourage you all to start with and then see what's appropriate, culturally responsive for your students. Thank you, Amparo, yes, the intentionality piece of this. So I wanna pause here, um, give you all a moment. I know that was a lot, but I just also just dropped on you. I feel like I'm just continuously <laughs> giving y'all a lot to um, think about. Um, but if anybody wants to um, respond to this, anything that's coming up for you, you're, um, as we transition out of this, I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, things that are coming up for you um, from the last, oh my gosh, it's been an hour already almost. Any questions you might have? Oh, Jason, do you wanna? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I was just uh, asking, cause you were using the term, I don't want them to take on these roles. I think I, I just needed to clarify uh, a clarification. What do you mean by that? Yeah, so in the activity, uh, it, it does ask students to take on the role. So they would be introducing themselves as the historical figures that were on there. Mm -hmm. So they're being asked to take on those roles. Thank you. Yeah, I see a hand raised. I have a question. Yeah. Okay. So is it so let's say like I have a class and I have 30 something kids. So if I remove some of these people, are you doubling per per person? You know what I mean? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I would. Um, and that also just makes the sharing easy faster. Yeah. Uh, there's less people to talk to, but also um like that particular lesson, um, it's like folks in the countries of origin, but you could include folks in the diaspora too, to give yeah. you, um, to give you more um, historical figures. So like, I know that, that the interactivity that we just did, I'm hoping to add to that. Um, and that'll be like um, US Central Americans. Okay, and then would you, have you done this before? I guess, I've, done, okay. I've done it with educators yeah oh okay I was wondering like would you put like name tags like how are they finding okay I'm trying to read the directions I'm just trying, okay yeah in the directions they have you put on and then you write your name okay thank you and thank you Daisy for your comment in the chat so we'll get back to that. Um, but I do want to honor that we have uh, a guest speaker um, who I'm sure has plenty to say about what he just saw. Um, 
but I definitely, I'm going to take a moment to introduce him. I'm not going to say too much just because um, I want to honor that he's here to also share. Uh, but um, as we transition and um, think about like also just being culturally responsive, we wanted to also um, have an opportunity to hear um, Jason de la Aguila. Um, he's Guatemalan, first generation, born and raised in New York. Um, but he's also part of this organization called Desgua. And Desgua works to bridge uh, binational communities, um, uh, community networks, sorry, in collaboration for empowering the people of Guatemala. So um, between the US and Guatemala, correct me if I'm wrong, Jason. Um, and uh, their work, and he'll get into that a little bit further, uh, is, uh, is about creating um, fundamental economic and educational changes in order to pursue a dignified way of life for Guatemalan migrants and Maya communities. And so as we transition, and I know this is like a hard transition, so just go with me here. Um, I wanna just actually, as we transition, give uh, Jason an opportunity to introduce himself and then also just think through like, you know, these are some, some lessons you're hearing, some lesson ideas for educators. So I think a good natural transition might be like, what was your experience like um, in US public schools? I knew you, you grew up in New York, but how was your experience in terms of, was the curriculum culturally responsive to you? Thank you, Cindy, and thank you everyone. Uh, for the space. Um, so I grew up in New York in the 80s where the Cold War was still happening. I remember being very uh, uh, vaguely aware of what was going on when uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall was on the news. Uh, so there was still a lot of talk about evil communists. Um, so you can just imagine from there what <laughs> What, how public schools uh, treated or addressed uh, the culture my parents came from. Um, and I say that because as a kid, I was still just trying to understand the culture of the, of the world I was born into. And so when I went to school, before I even spoke to any of the teachers, the kids would be like, oh, so you Puerto Rican or Mexican? And so that's, that's the, that was the limit of my identity under other people's eyes. Um, and the teachers at best would be able to say, oh, he comes from, his parents come from one of those commie countries or, or whatever, right? Um, so I felt like as a kid, um, I've, I acknowledged very quickly that school was just a thing you got to go through till you get to high school, till you graduate high school. And since this was the 80s, like I, as a kid, I, I didn't know much about college and it probably was an option back then. You know, it wasn't, wasn't something that you have to do. And I just remember uh, the adults in my life being like, wow, you were born here and you speak the language, you set, that's it, you good. And so all I had to do was graduate and I was gonna have a good life or whatever under their eyes. So I felt like from my cultural background, there was just this expectation of like, you speak English and you got papers. What else do you want in this life? Um, and from everyone else in the world is, who are you if you're not Puerto Rican or Mexican? Um, so it wasn't until high school that I actually started uh, realizing that I had to build my own options. And so I feel you, Cindy, when you're talking about uh, wanting to drop out and as, as a teenager, I started cutting school as soon as I was actually, wow, I, I cut school for a week in fourth grade. <laughs> um, I got in trouble, didn't do it again till seventh grade. I was more, I was more strategic about it. Um, and then in high school, I got tired of, of cutting school and just being with a bunch of other uh, kids who weren't really learning um that we were just finding a place to hide and play video games and watch movies or whatever um so 
in high school, I started cutting school, but going to museums, sneaking into NYU and Columbia classes. Um, and to some of the professors, like I would get stopped sometimes like, kid, what are you doing here? Because I always looked younger than I was anyway. And I would just honestly tell them like, I can't be in school. I'd rather be here and learn some realness. And they're like, okay, well, <laughs> have a seat. And if you got any questions at the end, I'd be glad to talk to you. And so I remember even then, although those professors didn't really talk to, to me in depth, I remember uh, all of them asking me if I was interested in, in, in college after high school. Mm. Um, and then me having to actually look for, uh, well, through these discussions, I got put on to the idea of alternative high schools. And like my mind and heart were like, oh my God, yes, there's alternatives. You know, cause that the whole, as I told you the whole time I thought, oh, I'm gonna have to go through this like crappy curriculum for 12 years at, ver at the very least, just to be considered worth hiring. Um, and I need to be hired so I can live my life as an adult and do all the expectations of life. Um, so when I found out about, about alternative high schools, I started looking into them and feel free to look this school up. It's called City as School. Um, putting it in the chat just in case. So an alternative high school that I found out uh, at the time, I was also just finding out about, so as a teenager, you're finding out about the local modern culture. How did hip hop develop? How did graffiti de develop? How did punk grow? Um, and I feel like the first identity I felt akin to were hip hop and punk. I felt more hip hop and punk than I ever felt United States or Guatemalan, you know? <laughs> so uh, those were the cultures I first identified with. Um, and so City as School was a place where I could um, go to this school and not necessarily uh, be conformed to a curriculum that someone placed on me. They could tell me, you know you need this for, for graduation, here are our options, go apply yourself, good luck, Godspeed, and you know we're here if you need support. And the school was a school where I didn't have to call them Mr. Smith, Mrs. Rosenbaum or whatever, I got to call them Jane, I got to call them Lucy, I got to call them Andrew, John, and some of them are still friends and mentors today. So um, it wasn't till I got, uh, you know, my own, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Like I, I took ownership of my education, um, but it was also because I had to rebel with what I thought was, was my only option. Jason, I wanna ask That's... you, thank you so much for that. And within your answer, um, you brought up something that I know we've been talking a lot about in our last um, three sessions around Latino and more broadly around identity. And so you said, like you felt more punk rock or more hip hop described your identity more so than US or Guatemala. And I think that that's also something we've talked about here. Um, so I, my question is like, how do you self-identify? We've heard a little bit about how people tried to identify you, right? As Mexican or Puerto Rican, uh, but how do you self-identify um, and I know that there's gonna be words and I'll type some into the chat around being Central American and more specifically Guatemalan, right? Um, that folks might not be familiar with. Um, so as you're talking, I'll kind of throw some of those in the chat as well. Thank you. Uh, that's been a journey for me too. I mean, uh, I feel like the first things I saw with even in school, you had to check the box were Hispanic, Latino. I don't remember if Spanish was ever something you had to check if it wasn't about a language. I don't think if it was ever used as a cultural identity. But uh, I remember very soon being turned off by that. Hearing people say, I'm Spanish. Oh, 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 you, you, Catale you, you from Catalan? What? You from the Castillo re region? Wait, how are you Spanish? Um, so, um, and I understand Hispanic means of a culture that speaks Spanish. Um, and that's a little problematic too. It's like the, you know, my culture got Spanish imposed on it. You know, most of our cultures got Spanish imposed on it. 
But okay, technically we're Hispanic, Latino, but it's also like Italians and Portuguese folks don't identify as Latino if we're talking about descending from a Latin language. Um, that should include Italian, Portuguese, and French. And Spaniards don't call themselves Latino. So what's up with that? And then you go to Guatemala and they have Ladino. And Ladino has nothing to do with being Latin or Latino. Ladino is almost a misnomer word where it's like, well, you're not exactly white European, so we can't put you here. And you're not exactly indigenous, so we can't put you there either. So vamos a poner al lado. We're gonna put you to the side. So you're Sidean, Ladino. <laughs> you want so I'm like, I'm not Sidean. What are you talking about? I'm not side eyeing you at all. So um, there's there's a bunch that I and, and I remember eventually just settling with Latino. And then Latinx came up and Latin. I was like, yeah, whatever. Um, and Ladino I got familiar with when I started traveling to Central America. Um, now I've been tra traveling to uh, Central America since I was five for every summer break. Uh, that was my privilege of being born in the States and, and having dual nationality. Um, but when I was in Guatemala, just the way I dressed didn't even get to Ladino. I was a gringo. Um, and in, in my hometown, I was never American because why are you asking me where I'm from? No, but where are you really from, from? And so I always, I always mess with people. Oh, you mean, why am I brown? No, it's okay to ask that. It's just a clearer question. <laughs> what makes me brown? Um, and then even more recently, we started breaking that down and how, how umbrella terms some of these terms are and how they're just really for the uh, comfort of a census or for some paper you're filling out. Um, Native American. Um, I prefer indigenous, but then there's the American Indian movement. Am I gonna tell these folks that, yo, you ain't using the right term where, you know, they identified and they're still doing their thing. So uh, I feel like my identity really depends on the context of the person who's asking. I had a friend from LA come to New York, ask me if I was Chicano and I was like, my dude, I don't even know what that means. I don't even know how to identify with something that, that I can't, Define. So you might see me as Chicano and cool, we still here, right? But um, I don't know what that is. I think I identify with being Olmec more than I identify as being Chicano. Because in my experience in Guatemala, I was um, related more to, to the Olmec history than my experience in New York being related to the Chicano history. And I'm much less New Yorican, so I couldn't. Um, and then one of the beautiful things I experienced recently in an indigenous community, community circle that I lived in in Guatemala is they say, you know what, when we hang out though, like our people from Sunil, which is a very indigenous community in Quetzaltenango, Guatemala, they say, they don't see you, they don't ask if you're Ladino or Indian. That's just J. And I'm like, oh my God, that's beautiful. Thank you. Um, and then I just want to touch on Chapino because someone was like, oh, yeah, you Chapin. And I'm like, mm, I'm not cool with that word, yo, because you can feel free to look it up. But Chapino is a, is a, I don't remember what century it's from, but it's an old bougie fashion from Spain. They were uncomfortable, loud shoes. So when you were Chapino, you're an uncomfortable, loud thing or something to be stepped on. So I can't identify that, even though I have, I wanted to get this Chapulín Colorado shirt, but it was CH for Chapino. I was like, yeah, I'm with it. But yeah, and it's, uh, it's the same as using the term Guanaco in El Salvador or even Boricua in Puerto Rico. But yeah, it's a colloquial reference to, to the country. And I'm also curious as to where Guanaco comes from because the only other time I hear that word is in South America with an animal that looks close to the llamas. And so to me, it's like, is that some kind of like cheap work meal? What you talk about? So wow. um, I'm not sure. I'm not trying to, to project that. I'm trying to understand where it comes from. If, if right now, all I know is that it's something similar to a llama in, in South America. And what I've learned is that our identities are never asked of us. They've been imposed on us. 
Someone imposed on me on that, that checklist. Someone came, some Hernan Cortez came down on Mexico into Central America and said, all right, we're gonna call you Guatemala. Pues, pues, pues. That's what these Nahuatl people are calling you, right? They're saying this place is Guatemala and so we're gonna call it Guatemala, so you Guatemaltecos. And it happens all over even the Pueblo nations. No indigenous people are calling themselves Pueblo, that's a Spanish word. Spaniards came by and said, that's a Pueblo, you don't gotta worry about it. So they took on the identity of Pueblos. Uh, so right now, the most recent thing I've found is when we study pre-colonial history, when someone, when someone else was naming us, we realized that even then other people were naming each other. Uh, there's a language in, in Guatemala, Mayan language called mam. And mam in another Mayan language, quiche, means elders, grandparents. And when you look at the uh, history of these languages, mam is an older language, and it was the language that was predominantly spoken where the quiche are mostly speaking now. So there was invasions between indigenous people too. And there was still people, like even, even uh, when you look at Pueblo nations, again, they'll have things that mean down the river people, up the hill people. But up the hill people, people are just saying, we live on the hill, but someone else called you that. And, and I, I, I'd like to believe that in pre-colonial times, it was more simplistic and it didn't come with negative connotations. So I'm gonna pause here, because I do wanna get, I, I'm hearing notes of indigeneity and that's gonna come up real soon as we talk about this one in a minute. But I wanna pause as you're listening to, right? And I wanna make sure I made that point again out loud that part of this work was we thought it was really important to hear from Central American students. What's up? Uh, and, but also to position the folks doing the work right now, right? And so as we're learning about freedom fighters from the past and freedom fighters from Los Angeles, um, I would also position Jason as a freedom fighter um, as well. And so as you're hearing all this and as you're hearing as the first part of the presentation in terms of identity, and being culturally responsive, what's coming up for you? Are there any questions? Um, give you a moment to reflect and then you're more than welcome to also unmute. While y'all are reflecting, I realized I didn't answer the question of what I identify as, because I said it, it can change as context goes. But if you let me choose my own identity, it's real simple. Like it's not even, I have friends who call themselves on pre, pre-classic Mayan. I love that, but I'm gonna stick with my own thing, which is very modern. I hear people say Chico Chispudo. And Chispudo, that's like, that's the sharp kid. That's the, yo, they, they get on it. So it's like, I still would like to just be like hip hop punk kid, Chico Chispulo. Um, but, okay. but I try to cross that bridge. And if, if I'm gonna use any like popular terms, I like the term Mesoamerican because it's, it's less of a map word and it's more of a cultural era, area word, which existed before Central America got divvied up in, by different empires. Sorry, Al, your turn. I'm in my car, so I hope you guys can hear. Um, <clears throat> I think what's coming up for me is how complex um, and how long it takes um, young people, old people, whatever we want to call ourselves, um, to develop a sense of identity and to feel comfortable with it. And I think the other piece is um, this undeniable connection to homeland and to ancestors that continues to be part of the story of Latino. And, I, and how important that is. Um, as well as the importance of 
<clears throat> and the ability to go to be able to go and visit, come back, and to see yourself participating and rejoicing and being part of those two parts of the world, how many parts of the world uh, Latinos uh, feel connected to it. And so I think that it, it makes it complex and it makes it joyful for me at the same time. Thank you, Amparo. We're really wondering too, like, and this can be a moment of self-reflection, but again, if you wanna share or in the chat or on you, like what implications or reflections are you thinking about in terms of your teaching? You know, we've been talking about reimagining Latinx History Month, maybe even the term Latinx, right? Um, so as you're reflecting, like what implications might this have on your teaching, on being culturally responsive, um, and on like the purpose of the month and the week. I also want to add that in Guatemala, I've been able to hear different uh, opinions as well. And I, I really valued hearing this from, from a brother over there was that he said, I didn't know I was an Indio till I lived in Guatemala City. And so, um, and the, the, the word Indio is also derogatory, uh, but also um, some countries embrace it. So again, I go back to this changes by, by context that you're walking into. Um, but uh, so that, that's what happened with this man. He left his context where they were all just people, where they were all just another person. In Maya, the word for a person is the number 20 because you got 10 fingers, 10 toes. You're a complete person. You're a winak. Um, so uh, he said, I didn't know I was an Indio till I went to Guatemala City where there's more Ladinos. And then uh, my, my friend and, and mentor, Willie said, I didn't know I was Latino till I went up to the States. Um, and so, uh, I, I know that what happens even in Guatemala and what happened in my family was that people let go of the language because that's not going to serve you here. You're only going to get judged and you don't need to know that language. You need to know the, lang the predominant language right now. Um, so that lets us, that, that separates us from our indigeneity. And even that happens to me. Like I, I still don't feel fully comfortable repping indigeneity because I didn't grow up in indigenous culture. But I go to places and people are like, look at this Indio looking ass dude, right? So, um, and, and I've had even indigenous friends being like, look at you, yeah, you, you Indian, get over here, get over here. So um, again, it just uh, depends on the context. And I think partially uh, based on my personal experience is how open your heart and mind are to the history of each of these labels and how you wanna to choose to identify it. And I only mention that because it could be tough for some kids to uh, identify with, the, with their indigeneity and their language if they've been shamed for it so long. I just thank you for sharing your personal story. It just leaves me thinking about like the dynamic nature of naming or identity um, over time and in context, like as you're talking about it and then I'm hearing you talk about it and then thinking about like Latinx Heritage Month and, and the census, right? The political motivations and that there's like a claiming of space in a Latinx Heritage Month, but in it is a political identity that obscures the day-to-day -day experience of groups of people beyond sort of like, oh, I'm Guatemalan, right? Like it's like, it's so much deeper than that. And so I just like appreciate being reminded of how alive identity is amidst these 
categories that for good or for bad are being imposed on folks. Thank you for that, Rachel. And you're bringing back the question that we were sitting with um, when this, when we started today, right? It's like, yeah, maybe that's part of the, the learning or the work that should be happening in this month. It's like really looking at the pros and cons or the benefits, and, and but also the way that using a pan-ethnic term really complicates um, identity. Um, that might, that's worthy of discussion during this month in particular, for sure. We'll, we'll definitely have another opportunity for folks to, um, yes. Yes, thank you, Ruth. Yeah, and how our identities, right, are beyond national borders, <laughs> beyond uh, nation states. Thank you for naming that, that's so important. It just reminded me, we were, we had a, I work for a high school district and we had some professional development over the summer about, cult, about um, culturally responsive pedagogy. And so many times we focus on nationality, ethnicity, but I mean, youth now more than ever, I think um, identify in so many ways. Like we have a, I mean, I teach mostly Central American um, students and like you ask them, oh, where, where would you want to go visit? You know, and they love Japan. They want to visit Japan and they're all into anime. And you would never expect that from a student who just immigrated, you know, yesterday, <laughs> you know? And so I love how like Jay really expands like the idea, the, the, how we view identity. And I think that's really important. Yeah, thank you, Mana. Yeah. And also just wanna name that sometimes um, just having your identity tied to a nation state can be really um, hard when there's a lot of trauma that's involved with that identity, right? And so when we're thinking of, um, like I just, like just being mindful that sometimes families wanna just lay low and don't want to have to talk about that stuff and how do we deal with that too so I think the offering up of like what I like in terms of music is also part of my identity that offers up a space to like um make students feel safe and comfortable in, and, and still being culturally responsive um and Jason I want to go back to um you started to bring up indigeneity um and I know that your work with um, Deswa, which we'll get into a little bit more after this question, um, but that the work of Deswa um, really does, is informed by Mayan Cosmovision um, and how you, you, you brought up how that wasn't really part of your upbringing necessarily, but that you connected um, to that. And so I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what that process has been like to connect to a part of your identity that maybe you weren't necessarily familiar with growing up? And then like, what are some of those um, things that you are connecting to? Um, like, I know you had given previously like examples of Mayan Cosmovision and how that relates to the work that this what does. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, I remember, going to Guatemala as a kid and just having the real sheltered experience. But I feel like just I've always had a rebellious and, and always asking questions no matter how uncomfortable it made you. <laughs> Not you, y'all here, but like whoever was conforming to the situation. And I remember even my dad like getting frustrated sometimes because I'd be like, but why? But how? Um, even as a kid when, when uh, migration and immigrants were villainized uh, when as a kid in the 80s in New York, I'm seeing like just 
ridiculous poverty, just blatant in your face poverty. And I'm like, if this is the richest country in the world, how is this possible? And just my dad explaining, well, there's politicians and they're corrupt. They're not paying attention. I'm like, why? Then why did they get voted in? Then why, 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 why? And he would have, why? He would eventually, look, man, just, I don't know, the world's effed. Um, so that spirit I've carried on me for years. And so even when I was in Guatemala, uh, I would see folks react weird to me and I'd ask, what's wrong? What'd I do? What, what I look like, what, and they're like, no, you're obviously an outsider. That's my cousins would be like, cause you're obviously an outsider, that's why. Um, and so I feel like that critical asking and, and, and looking at the world um, after a certain age, I remember being like, man, when I come out, he out here on my own steam, on my own questions, I'm gonna go and dig deeper than my family is daring to take me. Um, and that actually happened after the 1996 peace accords. And I was like, there was an internal conflict and I didn't know. I thought seeing tanks on the street was normal for Guatemala because that's how they would answer my questions. I'd be like, uh, why are there tanks on the streets? Oh, because the military does patrols. Why are they doing patrols? Oh, that's just what they do. Why? And my sister would say, why? You think every country is like the United States? Are you still not answering my question? And so not till 96 did I realize there was an internal conflict. The word communist was still used as a dirty language. And when that wasn't enough, it became terrorism. Um, so I knew that when I went to bury my father in El Salvador, because he married a Salvadorian woman, woman and um, I was getting to see more of the world that my, the adults in my life couldn't shelter me from. Um, I remember like making like a pact with my cousins, like I'm going to come back and we're going to tour Central America. We're going to get real into the nitty gritty. Um, and uh, um, that's, that's when my critical questions started coming and it was more learning about the recent history about uh, guerrilla warfare and, and, and conflicts and uh, internal conflicts and um, so I, I was learning more of that modern context and I was learning some of that modern context. I would have contact with some of this, these indigenous communities where I would get a glimpse to a world that I had no idea of. And this, uh, this world is so sheltered because it's been so used to being exploited or abused that they wouldn't even share it with a supposed Guatemalan kid. Look at this gringo. We can't start talking to him about the, the cholqui. Um, which is Chol, order, Kich, sun, the order of the sun. You start tracking how the sun moves. Um, and that's the beginning of understanding the Mayan cosmovision and its history. The Chol Kich, for the most part, has been passed down through, um, what's the word, uh, oral history. Um, the sad truth about uh, documented history of, of, of Mayans, let's say, and, we're gonna get into that maybe, but uh, is very limited. It's, it's based on the six codices that survived the burnings of everything that the, the invaders destroyed um, and what we're still finding at archeological sites. But none of those can be fully understood without crossing the bridge and being uh, guided by Mayan elders. So there's also still very few Mayan elders that would, will take on the responsibility of helping archeologists understand uh, about, almost two years ago, I was part of what was called a cultural astronomy tour where a university asked elders to be a part of it so, uh, so there could be more in-depth understanding of astronomy, its correlation to ancient ruins and what we know today in Mayan cultures. And there was beef. It was like, a, we need to sit down and hash this out because we're about to walk out of your tour and you're gonna look bad. It was beef because there was a history of exploiting the knowledge of elders to get you your grant to advance your career. You know what I mean? So and I'm sorry, I don't mean to point at y'all because this ain't y'all, but that's how the conversation was, right? And, they, and the university had to make time to diffuse that historical problem. And so, um, I just want to go to just how much I've been learning bridges 
academia, which has, uh, the academia that has studied Mayans call themselves Mayistas. And so some of these uh, elders will call themselves the, the people who study Mayistas. So we, we're starting to cross these bridges without necessarily uh, giving into uh, feeding the academy, but also being like the world of academics. You owe us our documents. You owe us what you've studied about us. And we need to cross that bridge. So that was that conversation. And I've been fortunate enough to learn this among uh, the academia world and the elder world. Uh, but that, that took years to even gain the trust to be involved in it. Because uh, you can't just walk in and be like, yo, show me this. Because uh, they'll give you the bare minimum. And there's enough history of even people not in academia, neo hippies and just adopting something and copy pasting for their own uh, Vedic calendars. Um, so that, that causes a lot of uh, misunderstanding and losing. And so I feel like that's been my journey to, to, uh, to finding out uh, what the Maya Cosmovision is. And in simplest explanations of what Cosmovision is, uh, yes, the cosmos are around us, the earth, but also that includes my immediate surroundings. You know, when does it rain? When's, when's rainy season? When do certain animals come out? When is the earth wetter than other times? All that is necessary for our own, not just survival, but how do communities thrive? How do we go from uh, this documentary, use this term, from the caves to the cosmos? Um, I, I think uh, and that documentary was Native America by PBS. It's a series. Uh, I cried multiple times. So if you can check it out, it's worth it. Um, and it connects the common threads of, um, yeah, of Native Americans across the Americas. And my personal dream is when we co uh, connect Aboriginal communities across the world and how we've been observing nature, the nature of the earth, but also the nature of the cosmos. And uh, I feel like that's, that's what helped us thrive from, from, from building caves to what is fetishized mostly today as the classic Maya or the classic Aztec, because <laughs> Mexicans weren't always Aztec. That was a small portion of what Mexico, of what we know now as Mexico to be. And even Mesoamerica wasn't always Mayan, there's other, uh, cultures there and, and I think uh, part of the richness of our identity is getting back to connecting those and how each one of those cultures added to the richness of our lives not just our identity our lives how do you turn regular grass into corn that's richness in the culture I don't know if I answered the question because I got into a passionate rant <laughs> you know what you're so good I definitely want to leave room, though, for folks to ask questions. So I think if we could just answer, um, I labeled you a freedom fighter because I definitely think that you are. And I know that in your work with Desgua, right, you're the U.S. director. And so I think I want to make sure to leave time to um, for folks who want to learn more. The link is in the chat. But if you could tell us what is the work that you do with Desgua and what are the goals of Desgua? Because um, I, I don't want to lose that. I think that's really powerful freedom work y'all are doing. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm going to add this link because it's something we're doing right now. Um, we put up a uh, GoFundMe and I'll get into that uh, as to how, how we got into all this. So my sister and this uh, mentor friend of mine, Willie, uh, we all met uh, winter of 2007. And uh, through, through a lot of chats, even about the current social political movements and our critiques and our analysis, um, which is, I really needed it uh, because like I told y'all just reading some of these names and reading some of these stories were, were, were triggering because I'm remembering uh, ex guerrilleros survivals of forced disappearance and torture tell me their stories. And so I, I hear uh, the, I'm reading these profiles and I'm hearing the echoes of these stories when they were told to me. And um, as much as it's important, and actually uh, feel free to look these guys up. This is an acronym, so let me add the dots. But uh, when I lived in Guatemala for two years from 2005 to 2007, 
I got involved with them because that acronym, and I'm going to say it in Spanish and, and we can translate it, but hijos, hijos y hijas por la identidad, la justicia contra el olvido y el silencio. Sons and daughters for identity, justice against silence and forgetting. Um, I got involved with them and one of the big things that hit me is, yeah, you can't remain silent and injustice. Yeah, we do have to um, uh, get our identity back. It just can't be thrown on us. Uh, the way I saw sons and daughters was more like sons and daughters of history that we're just tired of this messed up history being passed down to us. Uh, justice, of course, who don't want justice. Um, but to me, it's like, how do we define justice? And also, uh, that's how we, me, Willie, and my sister got into conversations that led us into like, well, a big part of the injustice is just how many people are caught chasing the American dream. How are you going to put up your house in beautiful Guatemala so you can hope that one of your family members makes it to the States to pay the, co you pay the coyote off the, the land that has been historically yours to hope your family could pay that land back, get a house there to their four by four truck or plasma screen. That's the American dream. And that we could all go have dinner at Pollo Campero. That's the American dream. And we are like, that's so twisted. We would love to have a little piece of land in Guatemala by the water and grow our own stuff. But that was also from the privilege of living in the United States and not realizing that that wasn't enough for them. There was still this risk. And so we were like, okay, so how do we start building the Guatemalan dream? And so we realized the importance of, of course, recovering the historic memory, which is where Mayan Cosmovision comes in, because it's older than the last 50 years or the last 500 years of capitalist oppression and colonial oppression. So uh, the idea was, okay, so how do we get back to the richness and the, the opportunities and thriving communities that pre-colonial life brought us, that pre-capitalist life or uh, the anti antithesis of capitalism being practiced in communities kept them alive and thriving. How do we get back to that? So we thought, okay, let's get back to that, uh, recovering the historic memory beyond uh, the recent horrors of the internal conflicts and guerrilla warfare. And that comes from that elder vision. And we realized, well, that's alternative education because that's never going to get taught to you in Guatemala or in, in public schools in the States. And, you know, hopefully that never, I'm wrong about that. And I, I see a possibility for that never to change right here in, in this chat. Um, so thank you and, and I applaud you all for being a part of that. Um, so, okay. so that's the alternative education part. Now go ahead, Cindy. Well, I think you're bringing up a good point, um, what you just said right now, which I think is like a really good piece is, um, in your view, how might you work with teachers or how might teachers work um, thinking of like the folks in this room have Central American students, um, just expanding on your last thought right now, because I think it's so important, like what would be that vision? Like you're saying like, you know, you, you hope that it might change. And so what might that look like for us? What is, you know, what is it that you would like to see? Um, and I think that's a good thing to leave us with as we're gonna be in the classrooms. Thank you. Um, that's great. Cause it's, it, it's, you're basically just adding to what I was already answering as far as Desgua. Cause the other, I just mentioned this alternative education. Uh, and before I explain how Desgua envisions alternative education, uh, the other aspect of DESWA is we need to also empower uh, an alternative economy. Uh, whereas your goal shouldn't be to buy uh, a, a four by four Toyota. And um, although great, if you can, you know, if it gets you around and it helps you get that job, but um, that's a small aspect of, of the dream you should be having economically. And so we were thinking, uh, just looking back to pre-colonial, uh, cacao is, is, is the oldest, the DNA of cacao is, it goes back to the Amazons. The oldest DNA of corn goes back to the Amazons. Uh, but the thing is, um, the, when you look at DNA of corn and cacao across the, 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 the Western hemisphere, um, 
most of it originates in Mesoamerica. Um, so I bring that up because those were the economies. The economies of Mesoamerica spread as far as North America and, and, and were still being uh, experimented and, and developed on in South America. Um, there's, there's theories that South Americans and, and, and Central Americans had trade traffic uh, not only through land, but across uh, the islands that connect from uh, what is now Venezuela up to even the Yucatan and Florida. Um, and then uh, there's, what's this place? Chaco Canyon in New Mexico uh, has proof of guacamaya feathers. Ain't no guacamayas in New Mexico. <laughs> They're in Mesoamerica. And those were trade, those were traded. So it's really like, how do we get back to trading the real resources that enrich in our lives? Um, and hell, it might be, yeah, I do own a car dealership. You want that truck? Great, get me these many pounds of cacao. I don't know, it could get to that. So how do I envision educate? Oh, 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 okay, so before I even go to education, that uh, alternative economy, the way we envisioned it relates to that GoFundMe I just shared is that first we need spaces. Our spaces have been colonized and our time has been colonized. And that's a whole other discussion just to, just to give you a teaser there on the, the colonization of our time. But um, we need to regain that space so we could have the time to regain our momentum as communities and as a culture. Um, and so that space is not only a place where you can try your alternative markets, where I can sell you Gorilla Coffee and, oh, I don't have it out, but um, uh, chocolate that has been made the same traditionally for generations. Um, so that's how we can support the alternative economies that still keep communities thriving. And I, I wanna just put out this quick example is pre-colonial history, community and post Maya, post classic Maya era, there's evidence of how people left the big cities and built small communities of seven to nine families who were in charge of different resources for the community. Maybe one family makes a giant well and reservoir for the town to have water all year round. One family is in charge of all the corn and cacao or squash so that we have something to eat all year round. So uh, with the last two minutes, our idea, uh, so the, the um, our idea for creating the space for that, uh, we're trying to buy a house in Quetzaltenango and it's a strategic place that connects a lot of towns. So we can have that space to not only uh, amplify the reach of, of these markets, but also to give a space to start giving uh, classes that's where the alternative education comes in. So we came up with what is called La Universidad Autónoma y Popular de las Artes. Uh, and that's its acronym, UAPA. Um, and so the idea comes from, yeah, how do we create spaces for not just classes on what you would learn in an academy, but yeah, how do you test the earth and know how many times a year you can grow corn? How do you make your own well? How do you fix the toxicity of your earth? Um, there's a lot of practical things that aren't taught in schools that could enrich in your lives. There's a lot of people who are maestros, they're masters, but they don't got a master's or a PhD. So they're not gonna be allowed to be, to be teachers. So the space is where can we have people trade their skills and knowledge um, and, and basically enrich in our, our our conocimiento and our sabiduría. And I say it in Spanish because knowledge um, translates different in other languages too. It's, it's what you know um, and what you learned, what you are conscious of and what you have experienced. These are different forms of languages. So how do we create a space for, for it to be able to trade it, to be able to be traded among people who have learned and experienced this with other folks who need to learn and experience it. And it doesn't have to be a grueling uh, process to just get registered for, for that school. And so that's, that's our alternative education and alternative economy. And that's how we can build that um, post-capitalist dream. And with that. <laughs> Thank you.
<laughs> and on that note, just mic drop. <laughs> I think this is really great. Thank you so much. I want to honor that it's 557, but if there's any questions that you all have, give me a moment to think about the last part of this presentation and what was said. Um, any questions that you might have for Jason as we still have him on for a few more minutes. Um, but also want to hear like, yeah, there you go. You've got some fans of this post-capitalism dream. Um, also want to hear, like, what are you taking away from today? And that can be in the chat. What are you leaving with? Um, what are you reconsidering or considering now in terms of a shift? Um, we've discussed a lot today, not just in terms of Latinx History Month, but also Cent Teach Central America Week. So what's one thing that's standing out to you that you're leaving with today and or questions for Jason in the last few minutes that we have together. Yes, broaden categories, identities, cosmologies, ways of seeing and being. Thank you. Any last comments, questions? So we know that uh, this is one of the meatier things to digest. Uh, and so we have definitely recorded this. We encourage you to, um, in our follow-up email, we'll send the recordings. We encourage you to come back to the recordings, sit with them, reflect. Um, we've given you um, Desgua's um, homepage and also there um, is Jason's um, email. So should you have follow-up questions. I'm sure you could reach him there as well. And we're going to end with Ruth's comment of, I'm leading with the inspiration to reimagine my U.S. history class, not just Latinx History Month. Yes, that's what we love to hear. So if y'all could just maybe send a love emoji or a clap emoji for Jason. Thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate you giving us your time. And I see Ruth uh, is on. So do you want to add to that? Um, I, I mean, I because I teach our um, newcomer, I teach all uh, US history EL newcomer students. And so it like there's always um, I mean, you have to pick and choose what you teach because uh, they come at, they have all kinds of different academic histories and, in, you know, they're learning English and like, it's just hard to get on the pacing plan. So, uh, or stay on the pacing plan. And yet you wanna, you know, give them a rich history where they see themselves. And I'm constantly taught, like playing with that in my head, like, I look at my list, I'm like, how do my kids see themselves in this? And you have to go outside the box. You have to unlearn so much of what we were taught about what is US history. And so um, even though that creates hours and hours of lesson planning for me, I think it's really important that, that we reimagine um, our, um, our courses with our students in mind and provide space for them to choose what they want to learn um, because they all, they come with the rich history. Uh, one of my students said in the very beginning of class, like uh, we were looking at, um, you know, like El Salvador. And he said, you know, I'm allergic to El Salvador. <laughs> and, and everybody's like, why? And he went on to talk about, you know, the 
the the poverty that he experienced and opened up to a very painful history and you know that's that's teaching us how to be empathetic and that's important to teach in our classes and to to model and to feel so it seems like every day it's an opportunity to reimagine um, your class when you give opportunities for students to to hear those diverse voices and those diverse experiences that they come with. Thank you so much. That was so beautifully put.